Okay, we're ready to get started. We're going to have a little fun in this session, hopefully. That's what the t-shirt thing was about. For those of you walking in late, you're like, what the hell is he talking about? I know, you got to be here on time. Okay, we're going to get started. We're going to talk about Kubernetes. Hopefully, you guys are excited about Kubernetes. By a show of hands, if you don't mind, how many people have put hands on Docker at this point and have tried some Docker stuff? The majority of you, okay, that, at this point, several years into it, it should be that way. How many people have hands on with Kubernetes at this point? All right, a fair number of you. So how many people, though, have actually been an app server developer? Like, how many WebLogic people out there use WebLogic in their history? Okay, fair number of you. How many people use WebSphere in your history? A few more WebSphere's than WebLogic. It's interesting. How about JBoss? All right, I'm an ex-JBoss guy and technically still a JBoss guy as part of Red Hat. So you app server people, but what I'm going to be trying to do is show you how Kubernetes is essentially your new app server. So that is the point of this presentation, but we're going to have some fun with it. I have three incredibly complicated demos because I tend to go for really complicated demonstrations, which might fail spectacularly. But if you remember a couple years ago, we did some really awesome stuff with like finger painting from your phone and balloon popping like Fruit Ninja. We're going to do something not quite as elaborate as that, but it'll still require you to get your phone out and help me out a little bit. Okay? So, one thing is we're going to give away a Chromebook based on a raffle, based on your tweets. If you mention at Burr Sutter, you have a nice photo, and of course you have the hashtag DevOx, we'll actually select that, and it's just a random selection, and based on whatever the software produces from a random standpoint, that person gets a Chromebook, uh, which is here on the table with me as an example. Must be present to win, because obviously I can't hand it to you. All right? So anyone outside the room, it won't actually work. Now, there's a bunch of free eBooks and other things that you might want. So just keep that in mind. There's a bunch of free things from a microservices perspective, reactive microservices. Also, a deep dive Istio tutorial that could take you like eight hours to go through. I'll give you a little taste of Istio just to give you some perspective on it. But again, we're going to show it to you in a few minutes, what normally would take you eight hours, let's say, to do on your own. There's also this great book around Istio Deep Dive for, uh, that you might want to check out. Do keep in mind, it's a little bit dated at this point. It's based on an older version of Istio. Myself and Christian are trying to get it updated right now. So obviously, I'm here not doing that. If you did come to DevOps a couple years ago, you might have saw Edson Yanaga's great presentation on how to deal with a monolithic database and a microservice architecture. We have a free ebook on that topic. Very, very popular book because everyone has a monolithic database, right? Not everybody's using all kinds of cool NoSQL databases. They still got the big honkin' Oracle, the big honkin' DB2, NoSQL server out there. Now, let's talk about Kubernetes and app servers. Now, for people who are coming from the Kubernetes community, they're like, why is he comparing us to app servers? Those things aren't so cool anymore. Well, I'm here to tell you that stuff is still pretty cool, but I'm going to show you how they compare and contrast and what you get from one platform versus another. So I am counting on the fact that most of you already know Docker. I'm counting on the fact that most of you already know app servers. And we're going to show you kind of the basis of Kubernetes. Now, the app server definition you see in Wikipedia looks like this one. An application server is a software framework that provides both facilities to create web applications and server, a server environment to run them. You get a set of components based on APIs, standardized APIs, that implement services like clustering, failover, and load balancing. And so developers can focus on business logic. That's a pretty reasonable definition. Would you guys agree? You can say yes. You know, it's okay to say yes. Okay. Are you getting out your phone, though, and sending out those tweets? And by the way, you can say things that are not nice, too. I'm okay with that. Okay. But here's the key point about this. APIs, clustering, and developers. Think about those three things for a second. We can boil it down to those three things. The purpose of the application server, because I started with application servers 20 plus years ago. Okay. It was, the point of it was to give you some API that you could write your business logic against, give you some form of clustering and failover and load balancing capability so your software stood up and stayed up, and so the developers could go about doing their job as building business applications. That was the whole point of application servers. All right? So let's show you a little bit of Istio real quick. Or sorry, we'll, we'll show you Istio and Kubernetes, because you've got to get to Kubernetes first. I showed a little bit of this uh, demonstration on Monday, but I'll go a little bit deeper here based on something that's kind of fun. I have a simple little application running in my Kubernetes environment called OpenShift back here. So OpenShift is Red Hat's uh, distribution of Kubernetes. That's not the application we're looking at. We're looking at this one. All right, so we have customer preference and recommendation right there. Three little services all connected together. It's actually, in this case, a Spring Boot, Spring Boot, and a Vertex application, but it doesn't matter what the implementation is. Uh, we have several examples of that for different implementations. Let me look at my recommendation service. Okay, I'm going to make a different name, uh, a different version of this here. 
I'll just put that right there, all right, since he was helping me throw t-shirts. And then we're gonna basically change the, the logging information here too, all right, let's put a V2 there so it's super obvious. And this is just a simple Vertex application, by the way, right? It's basically, it looks like Node.js if you're familiar with that programming model, but it's based on the JVM. And I did a deep dive presentation on this two years ago, but it's still my favorite, you know, how to quickly build a little Java-based application kind of technology, because I really love this declarative router capability you get with it. It's also super fast and super lightweight. But let me do Maven clean compile package. All right, I made a code change using Visual Studio Code right there. We get that new fat jar being created. All right, so there is our recommendation.jar. And, and with true fat jars, right, you just say recommendation. Java-jar recommendation, it deploys super fast. Let me see what it looks like. And if you think, by the way, I talk too fast, this is kind of how I always talk. I apologize for that. Well, maybe we'll slow down a notch. No, we won't have time. OK, so there's my little application. Looks pretty good from the Java perspective. You build it, you test it, kind of make a change to it. But what I need to do is now kind of get it ready for going into my production environment, my Kubernetes environment. So the one thing I got to do is build a Docker image, right? So let me look at my Docker images. Let's see if I'm connected correctly, because I've been changing things here, so it could have messed up. All right, so there's the three Docker images that represent customer preference and recommendation. I'm going to do a Docker build dash T example, cust uh, recommendation in this case, not customer. Uh, I got to spell everything correctly, v2 and dot. We're going to get a new Docker image. All right, you can kind of see right there. Notice it built very quickly because I've already downloaded all the actual sub layers from that perspective. But now I have my Docker image built. I can also do a quick run dash it dash p 8080 map to 8080. And example, if I spell things correctly, recommendation v2, lowercase v2. And I think that's right. Let's try that. OK, there we go. It's deployed. And in this case, because I'm running in a virtual machine, which is running my mini shift, my, my Kubernetes environment, I need to see the IP address. That is going to be that IP address right there. And I can say curl 8080. All right, so it looks like it's nicely containerized now. So the good news is I have a little Java application, easy to containerize, threw it into a Docker image, and now we're kind of ready to deploy it into Kubernetes land. So if I go over here and watch uh, kubectl get pods, if I'm in the right place, you can see I have these three pods already running. So I have customer, preference, and recommendation as individualized pods, which include that Docker image, that Docker container. And of course, it also has another sidecar container in there. That's why it says two by two. And we'll explain that a little bit more in a second. You can see I've had lots of restarts on this uh, example because I've restarted it, killed it, restarted it so many times. But this is what's actually running. Those three pods are what's customer, preference, and recommendation. Is that cool so far? OK. What we need now is to uh, actually run our deployment. So if I say do cube, cuddle, get deployments, we can see that there is, in fact, a customer, a preference, and a recommendation deployment. And that, of course, is the governing entity that basically says, my declarative state for Kubernetes is to basically have a customer, a preference, and a recommendation up and running. So if I say kubectl, kubectl, uh, describe, and deployment, do, 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 do deployment, and we'll go look at customer as an example. If I look at what's inside there, you can actually see there is, well, let's go up a little bit higher. You will see that there's my customer image right there, example customer. So that's what I want to run, the thing that I built for customer. You can see what ports it exposes, and that includes you know, things for uh, getting out monitoring, as specifically, as well as the 8080 that I need for my end user. A liveness probe and readiness probe, which are super critical. And we're going to show you a, uh, an advanced example a little bit later on that takes full advantage of those liveness probes and readiness probes. But keep in mind that you need to have them set in place so that you can ensure your application is, in fact, up, and a rolling update is successful, OK? You can also see we actually set things for like XMX here, because guess what? By default, the JVM often will eat all its memory, especially with Java 8, and blow up, OK? So when you start messing around with Java in a containerized environment, C groups may be the thing that actually bites you. It's not actually Docker. It's not actually Kubernetes. It's C groups. It's actually part of the Linux uh, core, Linux kernel, that will basically shut that thing down based on using too much memory. So you can see we specifically set the memory we know we need. And then, of course, we have this little extra thing 
that was added called the Envoy Sidecar. So this is a feature of Istio. So Istio layers on top of Kubernetes and gives you some additional capabilities. Right now, all we're seeing is generic stuff so far, OK? So we're, gonna, we're just showing the easy stuff. But let me go ahead and deploy that Kubernetes, or that, that Vertex application. I'm just going to copy and paste this line. Again, everything here is fully documented. Like I said, you can spend eight hours going through our tutorial or more. But there we go. I got that deployed. Watch the pods down here. I now have a new pod coming up. See, it's one of two. And we have to wait for it to go two of two. But watch what happens up top here when it goes two of two. Basically, by default, you get load balancing for free. So as I mentioned, if you think of our old school app servers, right, being we have APIs, we have clustering, and we have a developer experience, in this case, the clustering is out of the box. I don't have to think about scaling the application, per se. I just simply say, here's my code. You, Mr. Server, run it for me at scale. And so in this case, it's scaled up based on the fact that I have now deployed a second recommendation, v2 version, into production. And now it's load balancing for free. So that by itself is just straight up plain old Kubernetes, right? That, that is just n pretty normal stuff. We showed you this four years ago when we first introduced Kubernetes to the world at large. And people kind of were like, that is amazing. I get load balancing for free. I get essentially a clustering model for free. You get some failover for free. And it's essentially what we had with app servers back in the day, OK? Even though Vertex is certainly not an application server by the traditional sense. But it works for anything that you can put inside a pod. Maybe your .NET application, maybe your Python application, maybe your Node.js application. You get all this out of the box anyway. But there is our little application. By the way, to deploy a simple application, when I mentioned developer experience, I could have also just come in here, and you can see it right here, recommendation one and two. I could have easily just come into the user interface right, and said browse catalog and pick something. I want a new MySQL, or I want a new couch, uh, uh, cake PHP. I want a new Node.js application. I could just follow a wizard as well. OK, I'm kind of showing you the hard way, more the kind of standard way, if you will. But there's also user interface capabilities to basically say, load it right out of GitHub, set it up with uh, uh, webhooks so that every time you change in GitHub, it automatically changes within the runtime environment. We're going to kind of ignore that for now. But this set of pods is up and running, OK? Notice also, out of the box now, because I have Istio installed, I get monitoring for free. So you can kind of see this is, in fact, tutorial customer, namespace tutorial pod customer in this case, service customer. And you can see it's performing really well. There's no non-500 responses, right? all 200 responses. There's another thing that we, you should be aware of, and that is this thing called Kiali. Okay? Kiali is a service graph that we've implemented with the, at Red Hat, and we've donated to the upstream Istio community. And so you can kind of watch your transactions, see how they flow here. Okay? So we have basically, we have traffic coming in from my curl command, going in through customer, preference, Recommendation one and two. So you can kind of get a visual feel for how the traffic is flowing throughout the application. And of course, if you want more details on those traces, we have tracing in here also. Let's see what that looks like. Yep, here's our tracing. And I can basically show you, you know, things about what is the performance of each of those endpoints within the application. All right, so the concept of Jaeger-based tracing, Grafana-based monitoring, that's based on Prometheus, Kiali-based the service graph, as well as other application health and well-being details. You can kind of see I got a bunch of things running on this particular cluster. All of that is part of this infrastructure. And again, if you are familiar with application servers of old, WebLogic, WebSphere, JBoss, they did these things too. They allowed you to manage things at great scale so developers could go about just building the applications they want to build, as an example. OK? But let's show you some fun stuff. That's the easy stuff. That's the stuff that's just kind of out of the box. OK? Let's kind of have a little fun with it now. We have this little application running. You can kind of see it's going back and forth between this version 2, which has a count of 91, this version 1 of count of 80, uh, 877. OK? Still going along there. But now I want to change it up a bit. So I'm going to move this around. Uh, get pods. Cube cuddle get pods. All right, so there's our, there's our four pods that are running. And I'm going to come in here now and do this, OK? Dun, dun, dun. Whoop, not that one. I have a bunch of scripts to make this a little bit easier on myself so we can go a little bit faster. I'm going to basically scale up, though. I'm going to basically say, now, I want two of version two running. OK, so it's just a declarative state that you want. I want two of those things running because my application needs to be more HA, right? It needs to be highly available. And notice I just simply, because I declared I wanted two, you can see the second one is spinning up right now. And now it has come online. And you notice it's now part of the load balancer. 
And this is just a standard curl command. So you can kind of see right now, there's that new version two. You can tell by the number, the increment number. And more importantly, if you look at that string right there, that is the computer name that that Java application thinks it's running on. Okay, so this is the host name right here that the computer thinks it's running on, that Java, Java thinks it's running on. And it actually maps to this pod name, this pod identifier here. So see right here, you can see that's the pod name. And this is the pod name. And you can see host name here. So if we look back at that Java code real quick, let's just go look at it and kind of see host name, okay? Host name. So it's basically going to system get env get or default host name. And it's pretty straightforward. So the cool thing is Java thinks it's running on its own computer. It's unaware that all this magic is happening around it. Uh, and that's where this pod concept comes from. So now I have one third of my traffic going to version one, two thirds of my traffic going to version two. That's kind of cool by default. But let's kind of change that up a little bit. Let's actually scale back down. I don't need two version twos. I kind of like the 50-50 for a little while longer. But you can see it's now terminating. It is now gone. It's no longer part of the load balancer. OK? But here's where it gets really interesting. What if, in fact, we deployed that change too rapidly to production? Because one of the missions we're on as software developers at this point is no longer deploying every three months or every six months, but to deploy every week. And as a matter of fact, we want to deploy every Thursday at 10 a.m. local business time with users on the system. So we still want to have that rapid deployment cycle. That's where we are in this new world of DevOps and CICD and everything else. But in this case, I deployed, but the users don't see it. And now this is where Istio really starts to take over in this Kubernetes ecosystem. I can change the routing logic associated with those different pods. You can see I still have the two pods running. I have version one running and version two running. And now we're, but our users are only seeing version one right out of the box. So that's kind of cool by default. I can basically say, hey, I can roll to production, but maybe then slowly, inc uh, incrementally, roll out version two. So in this case, I can say I want 25% of the transactions to go to version two. And let's see here if it takes effect. You'll see a few version two showing up there. There they go. So it's a random load balancer. So it's about you know, 25%. If you count them all, you should get about 25%. But one thing that's really cool about this, again, this is an Istio feature. You basically are in a situation where you can define what that increment is. In the case of old school Kubernetes, it's always round robin, meaning you basically get, if you got three pods, you get 33, 33, 34. If you got four pods, 25, 25, 25. With Istio, I can say, I want 1% of my user transactions going to this new version, okay? And if again, if I don't want that, I can go back to version one. So we can just roll out a little canary release, see if our users want to interact with it, see if we get tweets that hate us on social media, see if our users complain, and if they do, roll it back very easily. But let's show you something a little bit more interesting, and that is, what if I want to see this in Safari? Okay. So notice we're still on version one from most users' perspective. If I come to Firefox, let's go here, it's still version one also. OK, interacting with that endpoint. But what if I actually go into Safari now? Uh, that's this window here. OK, you can see Safari is all version 2. So you can actually pick different HTTP headers and decide exactly what you want to route on. And this is actually a very powerful concept. In the standard book info dem demo, which comes with Istio, it actually uses just the login. Are you logged in or not logged in? But you could do things like, are you a beta customer running in Canada with, uh, you know, with Safari on iOS? Then you're into version 2. So you can be very unique and discreet. And I've actually talked to managers who are very excited about this kind of concept, because they're like, we're going we're gonna to roll out our canaries only to employees first. Because every one of our employees use the system as well. We're a software as a service company now. And they're going to make employees test the canary. And then they roll it out to beta customers who have logged in and opted in for beta. They get the canary. And then it rolls out to everybody should it should actually work out very well. So that concept is actually very powerful. And let's go here now. OK, well, not that one. This one, we're going to clean that canary out. So basically, we wiped out the canary concept and the Istio rules. And now we're back to standard 50-50. OK, is this cool so far? Am I going too fast? OK, normally you're supposed to say yes to that question. OK, but uh, I got you. All right, now let's show you this one. This is known as the dark launch. So what I've done now is I've gone back to another average users. Most users only see version 1. You can kind of see based on my curl up top, it's all version 1. But look at the, uh, look at the bottom down there, OK? Do you see version 2? Do you see that? 
So version two is also being called because all transactions are being mirrored to version two, yet the users are only getting responses from version one. Now this is a very powerful concept if you're thinking about that, you know, we're gonna deploy every Thursday at 10 a.m. We're gonna deploy every week. We're gonna deploy multiple times a day, like those super unicorns from Silicon Valley. What this means is I can roll my, tra uh, my new application change through my CI-CD deployment pipeline, literally land it in production, because there's no environment like production anywhere else in the world. We know that, right? It's certainly not like my laptop. Production is very unique. But it means I can run that code, monitor it for, let's say, exceptions showing up in its stack traces, right? And looking for stack traces in the logs, looking to see if it's blowing out its memory, which is fairly common with a Java application, right? Looking to see if it's running out of CPU. And then I can decide, let's let users see it or not see it. So this concept of the dark launch is very, very powerful. It was actually popularized by the folks at Facebook. That's kind of what we noticed uh, when this concept came into vogue because they launched Facebook Messenger, and on the day they launched it, it went to half a billion users. And you're probably thinking, as a software professional, how do you go from zero to half a billion users in a single day? That's actually, you know, it defies the laws of physics in some cases. And it's because they did a dark launch of it long before you ever saw it. And marketing happened on a certain day, but the software had been long in production being tested long before the day you saw it inside your user interface. Okay, so that concept is also very powerful, and I really like it, but let's actually show you something else. Okay, we're gonna get rid of this dark launch concept, and we're gonna clean off that mirror, it's called a mirror, and let's see here. All right, let's go to a 50-50 load balancer again, but this is 50-50 the Istio way, so it's a random 50-50, as opposed to the straight 50-50 you saw with regular Kubernetes, you can see it's changed now. Okay, and it's actually kinda looking at V2 pretty heavily there. But let me see, I'm gonna show you one more thing here. Okay, let's go here. And then, like I said, I have two other, even more complicated demos than this one. All right, so we're gonna go back to a v two V2s. See how there's two V2s, and this becomes important. You'll notice then we should get doubled up, we should get two thirds of the traffic going to V2 at this point, the second V2 in this case. So you can kinda see there's the first one, the first V2 going by, and this is the new version two going by, there we go. All right, so let's pick on one of these guys. Uh, let's, let's pick on the older one, and that is the NCB9J, that one. All right, let's go in here. We're gonna mess with them a little bit. Uh, control C, cube, cuddle, exec. You can actually SSH into this guy here. Okay, and that's what we're doing. We're basically shelling in, and we're gonna interact with them a little bit. So I'm now inside that app, uh, that machine, right, that pod, that container, there it is, I'm interacting with them a little bit, but we have a little special flag if you look at the code. We have a little flag that, flag that says misbehave, all right? So basically it's always returning 503s. My programmer did really bad things, okay? They basically made a code change, uh, but you know, it just didn't go very well. So let's go back to this, okay, you can see we have the version two. This is the one that's misbehaving right here. So it's throwing out 503s into the mix. We don't want that for our users. That's not good for our, our, company, our customers, okay? So we have this really kind of neat little thing in Istio called the pool ejector. And what the pool ejector does is it looks for misbehaving endpoints and throws it out of the load balancing pool for a little period of time, okay? And you can choose what that time is. You can kind of see most of the 503s are kind of gone now because the pool ejector basically said, just get it out of the system, and, uh, but, 503s can still happen, because that pod is still very much misbehaving. It's throwing up 503s like crazy, so we might still see one. So we can apply another Istio rule, so there's our, another 503. Another Istio rule, okay, that is apply a retry rule. And what this means is now we have the ultimate resiliency. We can apply circuit breakers and all sorts of exception handling, if you will, kind of at that network level. And in this case, what we have is uh, a misbehaving version two pod and version one still running out there, but the misbehaving one actually is not only thrown out of the load balancing pool, but when it does show back in the load balancing pool, if it coughs up an error, we retry to go to the other version two. Okay, so we should, we no longer have any 503s anymore, even though we still have that bad behavior from that bad actor out there. I'm kind of curious to see what our graph looks like over here. And let's see, what's our traffic animation. Okay, and you notice, uh, there we go. So it's trying to show us what's going on inside the system. And again, we have all this, uh, and actually, let's go over here real quick. Recommendation, okay, no, refresh, refresh. You know, we have our monitoring tools, and let's go to V2. See, notice we're getting some 503s now. 
Okay, we're getting some errors in the system, so we can kind of go figure out where the problem is and then fix it. So that's just a whirlwind tour of kind of intro to Kubernetes, clustering capability, failover capability, and kind of the awesomeness of Istio. All right, you guys still with me? Fantastic, because that was the easy stuff. Okay, let's, let's kind of rock you through some slides. I have two more really complicated demos to show you uh, because I kind of want to show you what this really means. But let's kind of talk back, uh, tell our story here a little bit more. Okay, so I want you to go back to 1999. I know it was a long time ago for some of you. Some of you were still living with your mom and dad. Some of you might still be living with your mom and dad, but that's a different story, right? You might have been in school at the time. You might have been, you know, who knows what you were doing back in 1999. I was doing a lot of different things in 1999 because I started programming actually in 1986, so I'd, I'd been around the block a little bit. But this was my favorite movie in 1999. Okay, so mentally get back into 1999 mode. That opening scene where Trinity kicked that cop back in the room, that, that was amazing, right? That was like my favorite movie of all time. Quite honestly, Star Wars uh, with Jar Jar Binks made more money than The Matrix in that year, but I could not put that on my slide, okay? The Matrix is by far and away the most awesome movie. Our top singers in 1999. Look at that. Cher, right? TLC. It was awesome back in 1999, and the ladies dominated the charts. You can see it right there, right? They kicked butt. They had the top uh, five songs of that year, okay? And the U.S. wins the FIFA World Cup. You guys remember that? Wow. This was the most amazing year. I'm not kidding you. As an American, this was an amazing year. We won the World Cup. Now, I want all of you to check your bias for a second. <laughs> we assumed something, didn't we? <laughs> but let me tell you a little story about this, because I actually, at this period of time in my life, not only was I about to prepare to volunteer for the local Java user group, which was just a little bit after this time period, but I was a software developer in Java, teaching Java developers at that point how to build web applications and servlets, and back before there was even really EJBs, we were showing people how to do server-side Java, not just applets, and I ran training classes during the day, but my evening job was to basically form a soccer program for young girls, and I had over 700 girls in the program, I had to recruit all the coaches, I coached hundreds and hundreds of girls myself, and so in 1999, this was an incredibly important moment, I can tell you that. My little girls loved this. And they, and I, I'll tell you, I coached up to age 18. I would take any 11 of you here and put you on the best of you in this room right now, and my girls would destroy you, okay? <laughs> they were really good. But, so, but I want you to think about that for a moment because the world has shifted. Our world has shifted, okay? So think about the 1999 for a Java developer. All right, and for the Java developer, Java was in this kind of tug of war. It was kind of interesting. I found this on InfoWorld as I was trying to look back in time. The Java market was heating up. As a matter of fact, at that point in time, Java surpassed C++ as the language of choice. Now, you have to think about the survey for a second and decide what did XML come from, right? <laughs> but that's okay. It, you know, we surpassed C++ in 1999. And I love this. This is in the same article. I didn't go looking for this, by the way. It said, the most obvious recent example is Red Hat's Linux, which in a short time has grown from hobbyist operating system to competitor that even Microsoft has taken seriously. Sun should learn from Red Hat. And if you're familiar with what's happened in the last couple weeks, yes, Sun should have learned from Red Hat, OK? Um, all right, so this is actually the really important part about what happened in this time era. Error. Specifically, if you remember Java code in this point in time, you had to buy your IDE. You had to spend, as a matter of fact, $25,000 for 10 developers to get an IDE at that time. It was an expensive thing to start your first block of Java code. It was thousands of dollars per developer to basically do Hello World on your desktop. That was the world we lived in back then. And a lot of people have forgotten that at this point because we have so many great tools, like you see me using VS Code on this laptop, but you know, even IntelliJ has a community version, right? We have Eclipse, we have NetBeans, we have so many options there. But also, look at this particular advice. We want to ensure your applications are created in a consistent fashion. They're scalable, reliable, and compatible with other enterprise applications. We strongly advise you to look at J2E. This was the world we were in back then. Everything was completely proprietary except for Java. Java was the only thing that we could build our applications in and have us even a chance of moving it from one platform to another. 
I don't know if you worked on pyramid machines like I did, or you worked on Unisys machines, or you worked on HP 3000s, or an AS400, previously a System 3638, but you could not move that code from one machine to another. That was the world we lived in back then. And this was our top app server of the day. They won the award for 1999, BA WebLogic. Okay, and you know the number one feature they loved? The clustering capabilities, because that was why we loved our app servers. That concept of how to do run our application at scale, scale it up, scale it down, load balance, have failover, the same things I just showed you at Kubernetes. Okay, now here's what it cost back in 1999 to start do Hello World for our website in Java. These are actually fairly real numbers. You saw the 25,000 that actually I picked out of the news article there. But it actually, if you read the fine print, it was 25,000 for the licenses and then 25,000 more per year for the subscription for support. So $50,000 for Semantic Cafe to get started. And you can see my web logic there may be a little light, but I called some people who worked for BEA back in the day and they were like, yeah, $60,000 for an average little you know, two core app server. Okay, you know, small little server that you throw in your rack. You can see the Sun Spark boxes were kind of expensive. I called a friend who worked for Sun in this era and said, can you go back through your old price list? And they were like, yeah, here's the prices. And of course, Oracle was the most expensive item. But the concept is half a million dollars to get started. We no longer live in that world. We can start with a thing on our laptop for free. All we have to have is the laptop. And the operating system is free now too, if that's where we want to go. And we can launch it into the cloud for a few cents per hour. OK, very different world than what we lived in before. Let's talk about APIs for a moment. And I want you to think about your application on the whiteboard for just one second. Because when, because well, let's put it this way. As developers, we're looking back over the code base of the, that we've been given, and we're thinking, what the hell was wrong with that programmer that got this code base before me? What was wrong with that architect who came up with this crazy idea? But in that day, whether it had been 2002 or 2005 or even 2013, that architect did design something pretty nice on the whiteboard. They actually had three tiers in their architecture, right? User interface and logic and data. They knew what their data model should have looked like because on the whiteboard, it's all good. And then we, you know, we had our three tiers, right? We had all our components nicely talking to each other. We knew what that architecture should have looked like. But this happens in real life. And it certainly happens over time. It happens when there's a lot of cooks in that kitchen in there working away on it and trying to change things over time. Okay, so this is kind of the mess we've created for ourselves, and we refer to this as the monolithic application, and it's a bad thing, but it actually runs our business. It runs all the billions of dollars of transactions for our organization, so it's technically not that bad a thing, but it is a kind of a problem. And our stack might have looked something like this. You can kind of see we had maybe, you know, depending on what error you started that application, right, we may have had J, J, uh, uh, Java server faces and ice faces. We might have Angular now or Ionic now. Many people still have a custom MVC. Anybody still out there with a custom model view controller uh, framework inside their environment? Only a few of you still? Fantastic. You know, Struts was born many, many years ago. And Spring MVC has been out a long time, too, when Keith Donald came up with it, I think, in 2007. So it's been, you know, you could have moved MVCs for uh, quite some time. But it's pretty common for us as developers to try to reinvent the world, right? We, oh, we don't need a new dependency injection framework. We'll just build our own. We don't need a messaging broker. We'll build our own. We don't need an app server. We'll build our own, OK? So here's the concept of, you see them right here, Struts and Spring, JSF Wicket, maybe JaxRS of that tier as well to communicate with a fat client like uh, Angular or Vue. And you can kind of see we have maybe our EJBs or our Spring Beans, our CDI, but we might have Camel or Drools or JPA and Hibernate at this tier or Ibatis. Lots of different things that we might have used. We might have had SSO, of course, across this. We might have had messaging, uh, message broker technology, caching technology, and even stored procedures in our database. But this is, you know, we had this sort of stack inside of our application, and we had these standardized APIs to work with. JDBC, JSTL, JAXAWS, and that was awesome. This gave us the framework to get started to build our applications. It gave us the recipes, if you will, so we knew how to build the application on top of that. And now we have Jakarta EE to replace J2EE and Java EE. So Java EE continues on with the Eclipse Foundation as Jakarta EE now. And they're gonna continue defining more standardized APIs and more universal ways of building applications on top of this next generation platform. You can kind of see the performance of the current TCKs moving through the Eclipse Foundation. You know, they're about 80% there getting those TCKs moved over. And the microprofile community, which was meeting last night at a boff here in town, right, a, a birds of a feather gathering, 
They're also defining further APIs for cloud-native architecture, for taking full advantage of a Kubernetes and Istio-based architecture that might be behind it, as an example. So you can build a lightweight enterprise Java application that is still standards-based and still run it anywhere that you want. There's a huge community in the microprofile world. You can see Fujitsu and Tommy Tribe, Red Hat, of course. You know These are all partners within this organization. IBM as well as part of that ecosystem working to make microprofile a better set of APIs and APIs that we should be familiar with because they do come from the original Java E kind of ecosystem. Now, there's all these other fat jar architectures. So not just microprofile as a fat jar architecture, you know, just basically bundle up the whole application like you saw me do into one single jar. But Drop Wizard really defined this idea early on. Vertex came up with it second, right? And they kind of came to be into being at the same time. Spring Boot, of course, made it fairly popular. But there's like Thorntail as a microprofile implementation. And you might have seen a session here at Dev, uh, DevOx on Micronaut, as an example, as a new uh, player in the space. And then there's the Java ecosystem APIs. So not just our standardized APIs that everybody could build on top of, and it wasn't just us as business developers that added our business logic on top, but it was a whole ecosystem of open source frameworks that added new capability on top of those standardized APIs. And we took full advantage of these things, right? We leveraged Hibernate and Spring, and we lose, use uh, Camel for integration. We use Kafka now for streaming-based systems, but we still might have used ActiveMQ for regular JMS technology, right? We might use InfiniSpan or Redis as our cache. All of these things are super, super popular and probably mixed into all your Palm XMLs at this point in time, okay? Now, clusters. Just briefly about clusters, I'm going to show you a demo of an advanced clustering idea. And by the way, these slides are available at Bitly Cube App Server. That'll get you access to all the other links. Uh, let me check on our raffle over here. Let's see if we got anybody in the game yet. All right, fantastic. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but let's do this. What am I going to show you now? All right, this is a complicated one. And I, actually, you guys have your phones out. I'm going to need your help. OK. Let's see here, do I have this up? Yeah, I need you to go to bit.ly pop movie one. All right, we're gonna try something with you. As I mentioned, the clustering is now part of the, apps, uh, the app platform, which is Kubernetes, right? Failover, load balancing, things like that. But one of the things we got super excited about with old school app servers was the ability to put stuff in a shopping cart, and if that node died, if your shopping cart was still intact. We called that the session. We used it extensively in servlets and JSPs and Spring MVC and everything else. This application does the same. And what I want to show you is we can do a rolling update, if it all works well, uh, against a live shopping cart. So if you guys put stuff in your shopping cart, uh, you can kind of see, I'll just pick some stuff here. We just grabbed the data off the internet, by the way, so that's where those movies come from. And you can see I have these items in my shopping cart right now. Crazy Rich Asians, by the way, is a great movie. You should go see it. OK, uh, but let's go, you go to Bitly Pop Movie for me. You can, that way you can keep me honest here. And actually, let me bring up this other one. OK, let me refresh real quick. Add a couple things here. OK, let's see here. What do I have there? What did I click? Got those two things. OK, now let me find the right window here. This little application is running, in this case, at Google. So I actually have not only a Kubernetes running here, OpenShift running here, I have it running across the three public clouds as well. This one's running on Google. Uh, we'll come back to that demo in a second. I want to show you this one, though. This is where this little application is running. Let me find the right window here. Let's actually go, let's look at the code just briefly. Bring up our Visual Studio code on it. OK, make that a little bit bigger. Do, 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 do. Yes, I know you have Java support. No worries there. So here's the thing with this one. This is using the health and readiness probe. And you, and you see right here, the liveness probe, health Z, Readiness probe, health Z, initial delay 60 seconds, give you some time to get your act together. But what this means is we can pre-warm our caches. We can basically go into the actual Java logic now and say, hey, is the cache manager all intact? Is it ready? Is we, have we replicated the user shopping cart over? And it only will kill the old service once it knows the new service is live and ready. All right, this is just a feature of Kubernetes, and we leverage that to basically say, move the user session data over. All the in-memory state can get moved over. OK, so let's see here. Let's actually just change something simple, OK, where it says shopping cart. See right here, it says shop, uh, where it says my movie cart, but that's the previous version. Let's actually make this the DevOx cart, OK? And let me, I need to log into the right cluster, because I'm on a different cluster right now. So let me copy this login command. We'll see how much I messed this up. 
Okay. There we go. OC project. Let's switch to the right namespace as well. This is pop movies. So we deploy into the right namespace. And then I have a simple script. But basically, we use a, a, a Fabricate Maven plugin to deploy this application. So Canary, there. All right, it's going to do my deploy. So that process of deployment does a full Maven build at this point. And if we see it, it will see it pop up down here when it gets going a little bit further. You can kind of watch it in the background and also watch it here in this user interface. You'll see that it's not only doing a Maven build, OK, it's also doing a Docker build, deploying it directly from the change on my laptop into the production runtime environment. So as I mentioned earlier, think in terms of APIs, clusters, developer experience, developer capability, this is just another way to make it more easy to deploy into Kubernetes rapidly. OK, I still have a deployment YAML. I still can have a Docker file, but I can remove those two things. But you can kind of see right now, it's actually going through the process of doing that deployment. You can kind of see it's starting that up here. And it's then, of course, the network is rather slow for me. But you'll notice that you'll see the Docker build happening right down here. And if we, we can actually watch the log. So it's actually doing the Docker build, not locally anymore, like I showed you earlier, but actually in the cloud and running it there. And the cool thing is, I can then easily, just like I showed you with Istio earlier, I can roll this into production, and in this case, with no data loss. All right? So if you remember the 12-factor rules, right? Stateless, stateless, stateless. 12-factor says there can be no data in your application. Your application has to be completely stateless. In a cloud-native architecture in this new era, you can actually keep data in your application as well. So you can kind of see it's chugging along there, again, because the network is kind of slow. It's taking a little time just to simply update my user interface, but it is going through the process there. Up, trying to update. Almost, almost. All right, and it's trying to check over here. And this is just a network connectivity issue. Uh, OK. Yep, yep. I think it got through the process. Let's see. All right, let's see if it got through the process. So I did, build, I build my, did my build. I did my deploy. Did anyone put stuff in your shopping cart? OK. Cool, right? So there's my stuff. I'm just going to hit refresh here just to make sure, yep, that's still my shopping cart. All right. Then we're going to roll out the new one. OK, so we're rolling out the new one. And let me double check this one over here. I'm running two versions here. OK, so my shopping carts are still intact. All right, and we're waiting just the 60 seconds. If you remember, the, we basically set this readiness probe for 60 seconds. Right there, initial delay, 60 seconds. Before it does the check, that gives us plenty of time to warm up our caches, connect to our databases, send a space shuttle to the moon, whatever it is we want to do in our Java application, and then we'll have a whole application. So we'll just a few more seconds here for this to come up. And then we'll see it join the cluster. All right, and then you notice this light blue? That's because it's not yet past its readiness probe. And there it goes, the first pod just did. So I can start tearing down this old one. I'm not purposely not using a rolling update. I'm more of a canary deployment. Notice also, if you look closely at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the actual computer name your Java application thinks it's running on right there. And let's see what this one says. OK, notice they're, they were on two different ones. OK, let me hit refresh here and hit refresh here. Make sure my shopping cart is still intact. All right, and then let's go ahead and kill this last one. In that case, because I killed one, you would have noticed that your, sh your server would have changed for one of them. That one did right there. And then let me go here, refresh. It's a DevOps cart now, and refresh. Uh, OK, come on, refresh for me. So go, go, go. Sometimes the browser doesn't refresh. Let's see. So this one refreshed. And you guys can refresh too, and you guys will see that you should have your shopping cart still in play, though my Firefox is acting up. There we go, Based, the network is not performing very well. But basically, we rolled a code change to production, just like we would in a super fast you know, deploy every day kind of thing, and we, all our data is still intact. Is that cool? OK. Now, we're going to run out of time, and I've got plenty of more things to show you. But I want to hit you with a couple of things real quick. Let's just show you the punchline of this one. All right. We're dealing with a timeline that looks like this. This is actually not that new. We've been thinking about these problems for many, many years, how to break up big teams into small teams, big waterfall projects into small agile projects, and now we're breaking up big old applications into small things called microservices, and we've been dealing with this Netflix world for quite some time, and now I'm here to tell you we're dealing with a Kubernetes way of dealing with things, okay? So Kubernetes came out in 2014. We were part of that effort at Red Hat to bring that uh, technology to market. We were in from the very get-go. We're the second largest contributor to Kubernetes, and we call that thing OpenShift. That's our supported version of it. And to make the point, 
of, in 2015, we launched 1,000 containers live on stage for an audience twice the size of this one, and we invited everyone in the audience to then claim their container, use their app server that we launched for them in two and a half minutes, but 1,000 plus app servers in two and a half minutes. That's kind of astronomical if you think about it. So that's the technology. Everybody's kind of fallen in love with the Kubernetes at this point. All the players that used to fight against it now are part of it, okay? And this is the ecosystem we're living in for Kubernetes. So it is vast. It has changed dramatically. Let me show you the Kubernetes cluster. The concept here is we have these series of nodes with our pods running on them, but we have this master controller here so that dev developers, like you see me interacting with it, but also ops can interact with it. Ops can set up things like quotas. They can set up things like resource constraints. They can determine how many cores you get and how, many CPU, uh, how, many, um, how much memory you get. And the developer can just deploy the app using the GUI or command line like you've seen me do. Okay? But this is an important point about dev and ops. We should separate, we've separated dev and ops in two different silos inside our organization. By a show of hands, how many people actually have a DevOps team inside their company right now? Yeah, a lot of you. How many, uh, keep your hands up if there are developers on that DevOps team. Oh, there's still a few of you, fantastic. Most DevOps teams don't have any developers on them. They forgot the point that it's dev and ops, and you can't just throw it over the wall any longer. I know we think we're Bat Lego Batman, right? And that's Harry Potter over there, but we can't do that any longer. We have to work together to deliver that software, okay? So I wanna show you another demonstration that kind of makes this cool, because, and you guys are, again, welcome to have all these slides. All right, but we're gonna run out of time, so let's show you this other demo. This one's even more complicated than the one we just saw because this one involves all those four clouds that I'm now running. Okay, so I'm, I basically have a Kubernetes environment on Amazon, all right, running here. That's my Amazon uh, screen, but this is in fact the Kubernetes environment, the OpenShift environment sitting on top of that. Okay, and again, it's a little bit slow to load there, but this is my Azure, all right, and again, I have the uh, Kubernetes environment, OpenShift environment there, and I have, v uh, sorry, uh, Google as well. So Google, Azure, and Amazon. Now I need you to try a different URL for me. Okay, a different URL for me. If you have your phone out, you wanna go to bit.ly hybrid open one, bit.ly hybrid open one. That's gonna give you this user interface. Let's see if this works for me here. I'm gonna push in a request, and notice it, go it hit the Google Cloud, and it says Aloha Burr. When you push in your request, you're gonna get an aloha based on the response from the message endpoint. So you're just basically are publishing a message, okay, and it's gonna go across the network, find the most appropriate place to run that uh, transaction, and give you a response. You can see a bunch of people have joined me now real fast. Notice you're all on GCP though. You're all on Google, right? Okay, so let's fix that real quick. Let's come over here and uh, let's look at this guy and this guy. Let's actually take the Google one offline. All right, so I'm gonna come over here and go into demo 2 AMQ, the right namespace. You will see, again, when, the, when it decides, the network is gonna to decide to load that screen for me. Come on. All right, but you can kind of see we got a bunch of things going in there. Oh, wow, this is slow. Okay, but and notice over here, it's flashing up Google, Google, Google's got all the workload. Granted, we're gonna change that now. Oh, wow. Okay, come on. Come on, browser, load that page. Okay, so by asking you guys to get on your phones, you guys just destroyed the network for me here. But, <laughs> but here's the point. You can kind of see that the, you can kind of actually see everything updating in real time. The fact that we have a Google processor. Wow, that's really getting slow to paint the screen. Uh, we have a Google processor. I wonder if I can connect to it from here. How about that? OC get pods. Let's see if the command line will connect faster than the browser. No, it's not. Cube code will get namespaces. Can I get connected? <coughs> oh, man. Okay. Well, this is where the network gets you. Isn't that, isn't that part of the problem? But you can kind of see a bunch of actually got messages in there for me. You can also see the performance characteristics of the different clouds. You can kind of see right here how many are being processed on Azure, how many are being processed on Google, how many are being processed on Burr, which is my local cloud. And I can't get the Google server to respond, okay? So, yeah, so it's responding very slowly. There we go. Uh, can I get pods? Okay, let me see if I can do this real quick. Edit, deployment. Well, at kubectl, get deployments. Let's figure out what our deployments are real quick. Here's all I want to do. I want to just kill that processor on Google. Okay, man, one minute left. 
and it's taking too long. Come on, show me those deployments. I can't remember the deployment name. I'm still connected to the Google cluster, but I can connect to any of them from here. Uh, come on now. All right, OC project, demo to AMQ. Let's make sure we're in the right one. Come on. Oh, wow. The user interface come back? Nope. All right. QB cuddle. Get deployments. Let's see what we have here. All right. Uh, AMQ interconnect. And our worker is not even showing up there. That's interesting. Oh, get pods. All right. There's our worker, 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 worker. OK, let's see if I can just kill it for now. You guys keep pushing messages in for me. Uh, dun, 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 let's just wipe it out and see what happens here. Uh, Burr again. There we go. So if you notice, we failed over to Burr, but Google's now come back online again. <laughs> so by default, it's going to restart those components. Oh, there it is. Now the user interface is coming up. Let's kill it. Now you're going to fail over to Burr. All right. So if the, there we go, we're on Burr, but I can actually come to my local one now and kill it. Because basically what we're doing is we're routing around the entire internet. So your transactions, no matter where they're coming from, let's actually kill Burr in this case, and now you'll fail over to uh, stuff, okay? You'll now fail over to Amazon. So your transaction was executed on Amazon, or in this case, one on Azure, right? You see the Azure one going by there? And if I actually spin up a bunch of load, if the responsiveness for the network will work for me, and we are out of time, but let's go here. You can kind of see what happens when things are going well. The whole concept is we can now move a single transaction around the internet. We can burst from one cloud to the next to the next. My application code is identical across all those clouds. The user experience is identical across all those clouds. And because I built my application the cloud native way, the Kubernetes way, and I can just simply deploy it, you can kind of see we have transactions now running on Azure. We have transactions running on Amazon. You can kind of see where they're originating from, and you can even watch the, uh, if the animation will work, right, it'll show you those, what the flow is there. You can see in the different directions things are going in, okay? Because all the messages you guys are pumping in here are actually coming through Google, which comes back to Burr, which goes out to Azure to process or Amazon to process. Well, again, we're basically out of time, but I wanted to kind of show you those cool things. OK, there's a lot of cool things to do. Uh, look at. InfiniSpan is how we did the shopping cart thing. Uh, these are the technologies we used for that messaging technology you saw there. If you want to run Kafka on Kubernetes, you do this with this project. If you want to re do real-time ETL, this is a Bezium project. Deal with your monolithic database. Lots of great stuff here. And that is really the end of our show. But do remember that you can get this slide deck right here at Bitly Cube App Server. And now we're ready for our raffle. You guys ready? All right. Let's see here. I'm going to go, wait, that, this one, this one here. I'm going to basically show you the number one finisher. We got a lot of people in play. And then let's see who it is. There we go. All right. So, Sebastian Laporte, you win our Chromebook today. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much for your time. And you, I do see you guys tried to break my application. <laughs> it looks like it worked out okay. All right, thank you for your time. If you have questions, I'll be around for, for a long time to come.